good morning to you all and uh, welcome to those of us who are visitors amongst us today. It's a, good, uh, it's a pleasure to come and worship our risen Lord and Saviour. And we're particularly uh, thankful to God for bringing us Keith Underhill. He'll be uh, giving us God's word this morning. And do, uh, do remember David, our pastor, in a prayer as he speaks to the congregation at Ashton as well, please. Uh, a couple of things before I hand over to Keith. Uh, firstly, that it is communion this evening. So please do remember that and come prepared. Um, there is also going to be an offering um, for the hardship and uh, fund and for those in need as well that we do. We've started to do fairly recently. So if you do want to give to that uh, work, then please do come with your offerings. And the box at the back will be, uh, be available to put the offerings in this evening for the, for the hardship fund. Uh, a slight change to our uh, midweek meeting. This week it's on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday the 9th. And it's at 7.30, it's by Zoom, and it's going to be um, Pepe Marino from EMF in Spain. So please do uh, sign into that if you, if you can. Uh, Stu will be sending out the details fairly soon for that as well. And I'll hand over to Keith. Thank you, Keith. Good morning. It's a privilege to be with you, to worship the Lord together uh, with you uh, this morning. We're going to read a few verses from Hebrews, chapter 12, as we uh, begin. They're about the Lord Jesus, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Let's join together in prayer. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. And we thank you that it was the joy that was set before him that enabled him to endure the cross and to bear our sins. We thank you because we know it's because he did that that today we can come and worship before your throne. We thank you that he's not dead. We thank you that he's alive, that he sits at the right hand of the throne of God on high. Lord, you have exhorted us to, to look to him, to consider him, and we pray, help us to do that this morning. Please help us to humble ourselves before you and to rejoice in you, our great triune God. Send your Holy Spirit to us, we pray. And hear us as we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And for a scripture reading, we're going to read 2 Thessalonians and chapter 3. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians and chapter 3. I should be preaching particularly from verse 5 of this chapter. Let's hear the word of God. Finally, brothers... 
Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honoured, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labour we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's sing again uh, this hymn, uh, Facing a Task Unfinished, as we read in verse 1, the word of the Lord still needs to speed ahead and be honoured, uh, doesn't it? And as we uh, look at the hymn and think of the words, you know, verse 1 is an extremely challenging verse if we say it in our minds. It says, uh, we renew our solemn pledge to make Christ known. May the Lord help us as we uh, consider these words from the hymn.
boys and girls, I want to say a few words particularly to you this morning. I don't know if you know that I lived in Africa for over 40 years. And I used to visit a place called Pokot. Now, of course, you've never heard of it. Uh, probably nobody has heard of it unless you've heard me speak about it. But it's where a people called the Pokot people live. They speak the language of Pokot. It's a very hilly place. Uh, you've never seen anything like it throughout the whole of the British Isles because there's a, a hill there called Tarakeet, which is above 8,000 feet. Do you know the tallest mountain in the British Isles? Do you know it? Ben Nevis, is it, in Scotland? It's about 4,400 feet. This is twice the size of that. Well, one day I was there and I was called to preach at a place called Kipcholio. Now, this was 15 or so years ago. You can see I'm an old man. So I wasn't young even in the year 2005. What I didn't realize was that this was a community of people who lived high up in the hills on a ridge, that is a flat piece of land, near the top. Well, my car had broken down. The shock absorber had come unhinged. And we had to walk there. I said, ah, no problem. I can do that. So, for five hours, in the hot sun, I walked. That was fine. And then my friend said, to my horror, up there is where we've got to go. I can tell you, my legs were tired. And there ahead of me was this steep, rocky path. I can't describe it to you. And at the age of 60, I had to do 10 steps uh, and get my breath. And I had to have an umbrella over my head to keep the sun from beating it down. That's a true story. What made me do it? What kept me going when really I should have said, come on. Let me stay at the bottom. You can go up to this community at Kipcholio. Well, of course, I was with others, some Kenyan uh, brothers like Andrew, and they loved me. They treated me like their father. And I knew they would never do anything to hurt me. So if they wanted me to go up there, there was a good reason for it. I knew that they were not playing a joke on me. Can you imagine if you've gone for five, six hours and you're completely exhausted and then you get up and you find there's nobody? It was just a joke. I knew they were not like that. But not only that, these friends of mine did everything they could to encourage me. You know, they didn't just say, well, you come at your own speed, we'll, we'll go ahead. They were there when I stopped every 10 steps. I felt like that's what they did. Uh, they stopped with me, talked to me, uh, encouraged me. And so uh, we got there. The sad part was most of the day had gone, just for your interest. We had 45 minutes of preaching, and then there was the five-hour trip uh, back. Now, why am I telling you that story? What encouraged me is what will encourage you children. If you are a Christian, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need encouragement. Let me tell you what encourages you to do what the Lord Jesus has told you to do. Do you know what the Lord Jesus expects of a Christian? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's easy to say, isn't it? 
Yes, we'll keep his commandments. But you know, sometimes keeping the commandments of Christ, it's like climbing a steep, rocky path when you're uh, finished as far as your legs are concerned. Because to keep Christ's commandments is to act differently to those boys and girls who are around you. And that's difficult. They lie. The Lord Jesus wants you to tell the truth. They mock other people. The Lord Jesus wants you to love them. Other children speak behind the back, don't they? They speak about teachers behind the back. Evil things. The Lord Jesus wants you to speak the truth lovingly. Other children revenge. They say, I'm going to pay you back for what you did. But the Lord Jesus wants us to leave vengeance with God and to repay evil with good. Other children boast. We know how weak and sinful we are before God. And the Lord Jesus wants us to be humble. We can go on and on, can't we? The, the commandments of Jesus mean that we live quite a different life from boys and girls around us. And it's hard to go against the crowd and those people you wrongly call friends. Let me encourage you, and this is what I'm going to be preaching on, that the Lord Jesus never commands his children to do anything that will be harmful to them or to others because he loves his children and he's died for us that he might save us. And the Lord Jesus himself has lived such a life of not following others but going the way of his father. And he's faced, he faced many, many hardships, even death itself. And that's a great encouragement when our Savior has gone ahead of us. So that's the encouragement I trust we shall all see from the Word of God this morning. So let's join together in prayer now. Father, we do thank you for your love in sending your Son for us. We don't deserve it. And what you have done for us in the Lord Jesus, we could never have done for ourselves. Lord, we pray for the boys and girls. We thank you they're here. We thank you that they hear your word at home, here when we gather together. We pray that you'll help them to understand that you are a God of great love. You never command your children to do what will harm them or harm others. And we pray, Lord, that as they seek to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow him, that they won't be afraid of what others can say and do to them. Please help them to be faithful, to walk in the path of your commandments throughout their childhood and into adulthood and even to the end. Please, Lord, raise up another generation of your people who are committed to doing your will. And we thank you that we have the great example in our Saviour who didn't give up when things were difficult but who was faithful to the end. Please, Lord, 
hear us as we pray uh, uh, for our children and as we pray for young people throughout our country. Please be merciful. And again, shower your saving blessing that your church, your churches will continue and the light of the gospel may continue to shine for the blessing of many in our country. Hear us as we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, let's sing or look at the words of a hymn about the incomparable love of Jesus. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus.
Don't we wish we could sing our hearts out uh, with that hymn, don't we? At least we can pray together now. Let's pray. Lord, when we begin to think of your, your love, your deep, deep love, and all that that means, Lord, we're so conscious of our unworthiness that you should set your love upon us even for a moment, but that you should give yourself even to the death upon the cross, that you should even now be there in heaven, not simply basking in the glory that is yours, but there remembering us and interceding for us that we might be saved and kept and finally brought uh, to where you are. We don't have words, Lord, to express. We know that we've hardly begun to understand what it all means. We are longing that you might reveal more of the breadth and length and height and depth of your love to us. Lord, we have tasted of your love and Because you loved us, we also say again this morning that we love you. We want to live lives of total devotion to you, out of love. Lord, we say there's nothing we wouldn't do if you want us to do it. And yet, Lord, even as we say it, we're so conscious that we've drawn back and we've been cold. We've sung about renewing our pledge to make you known, to go into all the world, and yet we've hardly begun to go around the corner of our own uh, community. And we do pray, Lord, that you will have mercy upon us We don't want to be like that Ephesian church that lost its first love. Please, Lord, forgive our sins of coldness, of lovelessness, of poor devotion, of selfishness, of worldliness. Lord, even this morning, so come to us that our love might be strengthened, for some perhaps rekindled, and for others it may begin as they get a a sight of the love of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us as a church that together we might stir one another up to love and good works. We pray that this time when we can't be together as we want to be or as we used to be, that nonetheless, Lord, we will use all the means at our disposal to so stir up one another that none of us might be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We pray, Lord, that we won't be hearers of your word only, but also doers. What a privilege we have to hear your word day by day as we read it, as some of us in our families gather together, as Sunday by Sunday we are here. And there's no famine of the word of God with us. And we can meet. And we thank you for these blessings, Lord. Please help us not to take them for granted.
but to be blessed through that word and to be more and more uh, conformed into the image of Christ. Pray, Lord, that you keep the church united. Help us to have that love for one another. Help us to count others as more significant than ourselves. Help us not to be judgmental or divisive. For, Lord, you've said that when the church is united, then the world will believe that you did send Jesus to be the Saviour. And so, Lord, we pray for our country which is in such spiritual darkness where the voice of your people seems to be so weak. We want to pray, Lord, for those who are appointed to be your ministers of the gospel. Please help them to be truthful, not to hide any of the counsel of God, to be faithful, therefore, and to be bold, and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit they may be powerful, Lord, to tear down the strongholds of Satan, those false thoughts that multitudes of men and women have about spiritual things. Please empower your servants, even today, O oh Lord. We do pray for uh, our brother David Campbell, especially uh, our pastor here who is there in Ashton. Please bless him and encourage that church. You know its needs, Lord, uh, especially of a of a pastor, we pray for your blessing upon them as they meet this morning. We pray that same blessing up and down the land, Lord. Indeed, we thank you that we can say throughout the world because there are those who meet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today in every corner. And we pray that you will accompany that word with blessing. May there be a reviving, Lord. May even the struggles, the persecutions that your people go through be the very means of strengthening your people that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ may be the more clearly made known. We do pray, Lord, those parts of the world, those groups of people, many of them in their millions upon millions, who have no messenger, who have no opportunity of hearing the word of God in their own language, please raise up those who will take the gospel to them, Lord. Think of the uh, uh, Somali people and thank you that there are those who do it by radio and there are those who are bold enough to secretly go in and speak. Bless their efforts, Lord. Build a church from amongst that people also, we pray. So hear us, Lord, and bless us now as we uh, come to uh, hear your word. Speak to us through it. Encourage us, we pray. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. If you turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, particularly verses 4 and 5, I want to encourage you in your life of obedience to the Lord. Surely that's the life you want to live, isn't it? And we need every encouragement uh, to do that in these Days. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And we have confidence, Paul writes to this church, 
We have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and you will do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now this Thessalonian church was one of the most encouraging churches that we read of in these apostolic times. It was encouraging because in the midst of their suffering, they were growing. He says in chapter 1 and verse 3 of this very letter, as he begins it, he says, we're thanking God because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. And therefore we're boasting uh, about you among other churches. We're saying, look at the Thessalonians. Look at their steadfastness, verse 4, and faith in all their persecutions. That's amazing, isn't it? You might think that people will grow when everything's going well, as we call it. But here's a church that's growing, though there are persecutions and afflictions that they're enduring. And Paul writes the letter because he wants to further encourage them to be steadfast with that future hope of glory. Yet it was not a perfect church, hence the letter. There was a doctrinal problem. And hence, as always, when there's a doctrinal problem, there's a moral problem. There's a life problem. And Paul's going to address that. It's associated with false teaching about the day of the Lord or the return of Christ. You can read that in chapter 2. And the life problem, the moral problem that comes out of that, we read it in chapter 3. <clears throat> it's idleness. If Christ is coming soon, there's no need to work. That was the problem. And Paul is going, as we read in chapter 3, he's going to issue a very strong authoritative command that you saw it there in verse 6. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get stronger than that. He's saying, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, he is now commanding you. And he says the same in verse uh, 12 and a strong statement in verse 14 as well. Knowing that he's got to issue this very strong statement, Paul, as the very wise pastor, he cushions it. He uh, is very careful because he wants them to receive what he has to say and not immediately to reject it, which sadly tends to be our perversity. So... Uh, he wants to assure them that he's very confident that they will obey what he's about to command. And he prays to the Lord, verse 5, that the Lord will work in their hearts to enable them to obey. He's talking about the things that we command. There have been three commands so far in this letter. He says, first of all, in chapter 2, verse 2, don't be quickly shaken in mind or be excited, you know. We've made the calculations. It looks like the end is coming. Next year, Jesus is coming. Are there not people even today saying things like that? It looks the right time now, doesn't it, for the Antichrist to come. Somebody is saying, maybe it's true. But maybe it's not true. But don't be quickly shaken in mind or excited. Paul says, chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Stand firm and hold to the traditions. 
By traditions, he means what we apostles of Jesus Christ have brought to you. Stand firm in those. So to us, that means stand firm in the scriptures. Don't turn to the right or to the left. And then here in chapter 3, he says, pray for us. Pray for those particularly who are tasked to bring the word of God to others. I wonder if Paul was writing to North Preston Evangelical Church, I wonder what the particular commands would be. I've got some suggestions to you at the end of what I'm going to say to you this morning. But let's be encouraged by what Paul has to write so that we live lives of greater obedience to the glory of God. Now, first thing I want to say to you is that Paul was very confident of their obedience. You see that in verse 4. We have confidence in the Lord about you. This is how highly he thought of the Thessalonians. He was confident because he had evidence of their obedience in the past. You know, from the very time of their conversion, and they were converted in the very fires of affliction. You can see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. Although they were troubled and persecuted from the very first act of faith in Christ that they made, they obeyed what the apostles said. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in the surrounding areas. They didn't just become people who said, we've become Christians. They actually were those who turned from idols to serve the living and true God. They were practical Christians. And they continued to be so. No amount of trouble could turn them aside from their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul looks at their past conduct up to the time that he's writing this letter. And he says, I'm confident. But he has a far deeper reason why he's confident. Because you notice what he says. It's not that I have confidence about you. But he says in verse 4, I have confidence in the Lord about you. It's a favorite phrase to describe a Christian. What's a Christian? Somebody who is in the Lord. The Christian is much more than a person who has put his or her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the human perspective. But there's another perspective, a far more important perspective. The Christian is one who is in union with Jesus Christ. It's not merely that I'm in him because I trust in him, but his life is in me. It's the picture of the, the vine, the tree, and its branches. I'm the branch. I can only live because the life of the tree, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ is in me. You see, Paul has no confidence in human nature, even where a true Christian is concerned. The confidence that Paul has is in the Lord who indwells the believer, the Lord who works in us to enable us to obey. So may I say to you that it's impossible to be a Christian, that is, to be in the Lord and to be unconcerned about obeying him. If you're in the Lord, that is what you want to do. One of the great blessings of the saving work of Jesus Christ is that it guarantees our obedience let me just give you one example. 
you know, in the Old Testament, the problem, if I may use the word problem, the problem with the Old Covenant, there's no problem with the covenant itself, but with the people with whom it was made, was that that covenant did not guarantee the obedience of the Old Covenant people. And so, time and time again, they turned aside. So the prophet Ezekiel, say in Ezekiel 36 and verse 27, says, I'm going to put my spirit within you. This is a new covenant. I'm going to come and live within all of God's people to cause you to walk in my commandments. It's a great blessing of the new covenant. And hence, Paul is very confident about these Christians who are in the Lord. So then the second thing I want to say to you this morning is then, how can we grow in this obedience? Because it's not something automatic. We have our own responsibility as the Lord works in us. But we must say, first of all, that as our obedience does depend upon our relationship to the Lord, we're in the Lord, so Paul expresses a prayer to the Lord because without the Lord day by day, we cannot give that obedience which we ought to do. You'll notice in verse 5 that Paul's prayer is, may the Lord direct your hearts. It's the Lord who must do it. And the Lord must work in our heart. Obedience, my friends, is first of all an issue of the heart, not of outward activity. How many times do you read in the Bible of people who had all the right religious actions Their lips, if you like, said the right things, but their heart was far from him. Just as the source of sin is in the heart, out of the heart come all these sins. So the source of obedience is in the heart. And please, when we talk about heart today, we tend to talk about emotions. That's not the way the Bible looks at the word heart. The heart is our inner self. It's the source from which everything comes. It includes our emotions, yes, but our mind and everything that's within us. So, guard your heart, the proverb says, for from it flow the springs of life. So, we must emphasize that our Christianity, if it's genuine, is a heart religion. And it's not first correct outward conduct. There are many who refrain from obvious sins. They do the proper religious observances, but they don't have this heart directed to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Now, as Paul prays, he says he wants the Lord to direct their hearts. Now, that means more than saying, oh, that's the way to go. You know, we're talking with someone who says, could you tell me how to get to uh, the center of town? And you say, well, you go that way. This is more than that. It presupposes that there are obstacles in the way. Uh, as you're going along, well, maybe not in UK, but uh, there in Kenya, I've gone along roads and suddenly I found a big tree across the road. Unless I get out, and in one case, unless I get an axe, and chop it because it's too heavy to move, even with a group of people. I can't proceed. 
That's the idea here. There are obstacles in the way to this, and the, we want the Lord to direct the heart and to overcome those obstacles. Let me give you obstacles to our having our hearts directed to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. If we have the wrong motives in our lives, you see, we talk about heart issues here, aren't we? If you are wanting a life free from trouble, you'll never be encouraged to obedience. May I say it openly? I hear too much praying where the praying is directed towards, if I put it very crassly, God, will you take away all our difficulties? That is not what the Lord has promised to do, is it? He's promised to give us grace in those difficulties, although he may be very gracious and take them away. Maybe we want success in this life. That's our motive. That's a spiritual obstacle to having the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ influencing us. It may be laziness, not giving time to thinking about these things, being too busy, not creating time. The greatest motives to growing in obedience are the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. So let's look at each of those in turn. First of all, then, the love of God. Taking those words by themselves, that could mean quite a few things. It could even mean my love for God, but that's not what it means here. This is God's love for me. May the Lord direct your hearts to know, to consider to meditate upon, to be influenced by, to be empowered by that love that God has in Christ for us. That's Paul's constant uh, usage of the word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. We know those words very well, don't we? That's God's love for me. We need to understand more of the length and the breadth and the depth of the, and the height of God's love in Christ. And the more we know that, the more we will desire to obey and be enabled to obey. <clears throat> True obedience is not our response uh, of threats out of a slavish fear, but it's out of the Father's love to us. Let's just consider from John's first letter, chapter 4 and verse 10. Let's just consider for a moment the love of God. Something we all know about, but this is what we need to bring our thoughts back to our hearts, back to again and again and again. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper this evening and regularly, isn't it? That we remember Christ and the love of God in Christ. In this is love, John writes, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Think of the gift that shows the greatness of God's love. Nothing less than God's only Son. His Son. Leaving the bosom of the Father. Coming into this world of sinners. 
Think of what God did in Christ, in his love. It says, he sent him to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation carries the idea of removing the anger of God. People don't like to think about that in our so-called uh, modern society. But I tell you, back there in Africa, it's not like that. They know, traditionally, that if there is drought or floods or an epidemic, they know that God is angry, and that's what they believe. And so they bring a sacrifice to turn away the anger of God. I remember that being done in 1973 in a certain place in, in Kenya, and the Rendili, they burn a male camel to ashes when there's a prolonged drought. That's the idea behind this, that God is angry because of our sins, and justly so. And God himself, the one who has been offended, he is the one who out of his love provides in his son the very sacrifice, the very means by which his anger can be turned away and we can be reconciled to God and be at peace with him. And for whom does he do it? Does he do it for those who are trying their best, who are uh, uh, seeking to be obedient. No, he does it for us sinners who have gone our own way. God's love doesn't respond to anything in me because we've come to see, haven't you? There's nothing good that dwells in you. Even your best acts you know from your heart, are like filthy rags, as the scripture says. This love, then, it's a sovereign love. It's a free love, given because that's what God delights to do. It's unconditional, <clears throat> and therefore, it's an eternal love. There's nothing in me that's going to turn it away. It's an unfailing love, because it's God's love. Don't think of love here as an emotion because emotions are very changeable. This love is so strong that when God sets his love upon you, he brings to completion that which he determined to do in his love. He saves, he keeps, and finally he glorifies. Now, in five minutes... How can one even begin to talk about the love of God in a way that's convicting? But the reality is that it's that love that we respond to. The more we understand that love, the more we love him. And when we love him, as Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So it is this love of God, as the Lord directs our hearts to it, that enables us to grow in our obedience. I ask you now, how can one who loves us like this ever command you to do anything that is harmful to you? Surely, all his commands are born out of love, that if you keep them, it will be for your greatest blessing, not to mention the glory to his name. So first of all, there's the love of God. Secondly, here in Second Thessalonians, there's the steadfastness of Christ. Again, it's not primarily his steadfastness with me, although... He's endured me. There's no question about that. And we could talk about that. But this, I believe, is his own steadfast obedience 
during his earthly life. It's more than patience. You know, you can be patient by just shutting your eyes and doing nothing and just waiting for uh, the next half an hour to go away. But steadfastness has the idea of endurance, that there's hardship, that there's suffering, that you're battling against the wind. You're rowing upstream against the current. And again, let's look at a, an example. Uh, and we read it earlier as we began our service. Hebrews chapter 12. The great example of endurance, of steadfastness, is our Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in verse 1 to run the race with endurance, looking to Jesus. Why? Because he endured even the cross. And verse 3, he endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Jesus is the great example. Just think of what he faced in his life. He was rejected by his own people. I don't think I've thought about that enough. Imagine you've grown up in Nazareth. You know everybody. Because that's society there. Everybody knows you. And you go back there with the message of the gospel and what do people do? They reject you. Can you imagine the, what you feel? What would you feel? That's the great question that's asked everyone today, isn't it? How do you feel about it? But the temptation to be discouraged is great. But even his disciples were such a problem, weren't they? Look at Peter. When Jesus says, you're right, Peter, you've confessed that I'm the Christ and I'm going to suffer and be killed. And Peter says, that's never going to happen to you. Peter opposes him as if he's Satan himself. At the end, they all leave him. And Peter denies him. Not to mention that Jesus is hounded by the devil. He goes out into the wilderness. And the devil, as it were, opens up all barrels on him to destroy him. And then at the end, he tries it one more time in Gethsemane. And it's so terrible that Jesus says, my soul is troubled, even to death. Those are the struggles that Jesus faced, aren't they? The real troubles. Jesus is really a man like us yet without sin. He was really tempted in every point like we are. And yet, not once did he relax. He was tempted, but he never relaxed. He was never careless. He was never discouraged. He never ceased to do the Father's will. He said, my meat and my drink is to do the will of him who sent me. The end, he said, Father, I've done what you wanted me to do. And finally, of course, he was forsaken of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he still trusted him. My God, even though he had no visible evidence to confront him, it was total darkness, literally, He was steadfast, wasn't he? And as the pioneer, he blazed the trail so that we can follow in his footsteps. So what enabled him to persevere triumphant to the end? It was the joy that was set before him. Let me ask you, was it worth it for Jesus? Did Jesus gain his objective by being steadfast to the end? Was God faithful 
to his promises to his son? Well, you know the answer to that, don't you? Yes, yes, and yes. It was worth it. I say to you then, continuance in unconditional and full obedience is the only way forward for me and for you. No trial that you're undergoing, my friend, is sufficient excuse for you not to obey what the Lord is saying to you. And may this, this motive and this example be fulfilled in every one of us so that we shall be Christians who are marked by true obedience to the Lord. Now, as I finish, what areas might you need encouragement in obedience this morning? I want to be very practical. I keep hearing that we live in difficult times. But that's simply a truism, isn't it? The so-called difficulties we have are nothing compared to what some other Christians are going through in this world. There's a Christian in Hargeza today, Somaliland, who was arrested simply because he became a Christian. Simply that. That may come to us, but not yet. Are you continuing to be faithful in the lockdown? Are you rejoicing rather than grumbling? Because we're commanded to rejoice in all circumstances, aren't we? Are you putting all your hopes in the Lord or in the vaccine? Are you waiting, and I think this is one of the most important things of all, are you waiting for the coming of the Saviour or hoping that in June the lockdown will be finished? I hope it will be finished in June, I must say. But that's not what we're hoping for as Christians, is it? May the Lord come. Maranatha. Are you fearful? Are you fearful of the virus? Are you fearful of the way the country seems to be going? Are you being tempted to compromise? I think I've spoken of some realities then, haven't I? Where we need the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ to enable us to keep walking in the way of obedience. And such obedience then is the mark of a true Christian. Is that the sort of life you want to live? Do you say in your heart now, Lord, please help me. Please direct my heart that your love may grip me and that the example of your steadfastness might be such an example to me that I shall follow in your footsteps. If not... My friend, you need to repent of your unwillingness, may I say rebelliousness, in refusing to follow the commands of God. May I say to you that without holiness, without obedience, no one will see the Lord. And by faith in Christ, what you need is to be joined with Christ like a branch to a tree that through him, living in you, you might bear the fruit of holiness. How can you do that? You need to confess your disobedience. And you need to seek the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. And he will give you his Holy Spirit to enable you to keep his commandments. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that you will direct our hearts through this word and by your spirit so that we might want to be like Christ above everything else. 
please help us to meditate upon what you have spoken to us this morning. Please grant, Lord, that we might be those who joyfully and totally keep your commandments. Hear us because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's finish with this hymn, At the Name of Jesus, Every Knee Shall Bow. Let's bow before the Lord Jesus and let's confess him from our hearts. Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.